Hi, welcome back to the uh, second half of the fluorescence tomography on Arabidopsis seed video. I'm Matt Newville from APS P1 1390E uh, GSE cars, and we were in the middle of uh, in the previous video we set up and did uh, fluorescence started to fluorescence tomography on this Arabidopsis seed that's going through the beam. It's not quite finished yet, but I thought that this would be a good chance to start looking at the data and. Um, and talking about what the data means. So we have our map that, if you recall, we were rotating and translating the beam. So we have maps of, uh, or let's show manganese, um, I think is what we were showing before. Uh, let me show a single color map of manganese, if I can get this to work. Um, single color. And we now have most of our rows, but not all of them. So if I show this map now, we see this is our map before we had a few rows. So now we're going up and again, this is a map of X along the horizontal axis and theta or rotation angle along the vertical axis. So if you can imagine spinning an object, this is a map of X and theta. So any pixel in that plane that we're scanning through will make a sine wave as we spin it as we spin the sample and raster the sample. So this is this map here is called a sinogram. Uh, and so this one, one point, one pixel in the map is making that sine wave. Some things are closer to the center and you see all these different sine waves weaving in and out. That's for manganese. Uh, if we look at iron in the same way, we see a similar set of sinograms, but they're, but they're as you'll see, if I just replace that, you see similarly, there are sine waves going through, but they're different. In fact, they seem to be clustered together in some sort of way that's interesting. And we plot those, we can plot those together with say another element in a three color map, we can see those superimposed on top of each other. So if I plot iron in, in say red, in a three color map, uh, iron in red, manganese in green, associating iron with red things, manganese with photosynthesis, and calcium, say, in, in blue, we'll get a map that looks like this with iron, with iron, manganese, and calcium in the different colors. And now we can start thinking about how that would map to from x and theta into x and y, so a virtual slice through the beam. Uh, I'm going to wait a little bit longer, collect a little more data as we go. Uh, it's not quite complete. I can see that it's on, it's about on row 600 out of 720. And we're doing a full rotation. I'll talk about that in a in a second. In fact, you can almost see it in this image. But I'm going to show you that if I, on this map, I can do pick area for XRF spectrum, and I'll just draw a fairly big blob here. We did this in the previous video, but I'll show this again, that this then brings up the X-ray fluorescence spectra for those points. So let's talk a little bit about X-ray fluorescence. Um, our incident beam energy is here at 11 keV. This is, uh, that's on a log scale. If I show that on with the y-axis uh, scale shown and on, you can see that that's logarithmic, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 counts per second. And with the incident energy here being 11 keV, I zoom in on that, we'll see a little bit of 11 keV and then a broad tail just below. That's again Compton scattering. I'll plot this on a linear scale. We'll see those again. Uh, we'll see the Compton scattering, we'll see the zinc, some copper, some iron, manganese and so on. We can go through the periodic table here and uh, show all of the elements that are in the sample. So here we have, again, elastic, Compton, zinc is predicted to be here. So there's a zinc K alpha and K beta emission. Um, we're sending uh, we're sending in 11 keV x-rays. We're, we're seeing zinc and lower concentrations. Let me just pause here and show a few slides on x-ray fluorescence. You may have seen some of these for the Neutron X-ray School or from some other school, but let me just show you so that we can talk about these uh, features in, in a little bit more detail. So I'm just going to drag this over here, uh, some slides on x-ray absorption fluorescence spectroscopy. I give these kinds of talks often. So x-rays are absorbed uh, by stuff through the photoelectric effect. Uh, that is, 
an X-ray goes in, it gets destroyed by by uh, its energy is absorbed by the by an atom, and that atom may have a little excess energy uh, from the X-ray, and that so that might eject a photoelectron from the deep core level. So the, the atom absorbs an X-ray when the X-ray energy is transferred to a core level electron. We make a hole in the atom when we absorb by kicking out or absorbing a, a 1s or a k level. Um, this leaves the atom in an excited state and there's a hole in the core or a core hole, an empty electronic orbital. Um, and we get a photoelectron. Should should note that this was what Einstein got the Nobel Prize for with describing the photoelectric effect. It's uh, it was foundationally important in understanding quantum mechanics as well as uh, uh, understanding the structure, the electronic structure of atoms. So when you have that excited state for an atom, a, a higher level electron, a core electron, can fill that electronic state and emit a characteristic X-ray. So that's that's has the energy that is the difference between the the uh, electronic levels. Of the of that particular atom. So if a 2p falls down and fills the 1s, that gives a k alpha. If a 3p uh, level falls into the 1s, that gives off a k beta. And those are those have very fixed uh, energies to to high precision, and they're all different for different elements. So you can just you can look at the emission from an X-ray spectrum, look at the emissions of, of X-rays of light, and see that. Uh, that what elements are in the sample. And you can use that to do quantitative analysis to, to, to determine how many X-rays are, how many atoms, what the relative abundance of the different atoms are in a sample. You can also, though, in addition to getting um, an X-ray emitted, you can emit an electron through the Auger effect, where an electron drops down to the from a mid-level down to the core level, to the deepest core level, and also emits an electron up into the continuum, there, since electrons are charged and have mass, you have to conserve momentum as well as energy. Um, uh, those and, the, and those Auger electrons or emitted electrons can also be used to, in the same way, to detect what elements are in a sample. You'll often see that in electron microscopes that you do both Auger or photo or photo emission is related to that effect as well, where where you create you kick out a, a, sh a shallow electron and watch the uh, emitted uh, light coming out those are all related one of the other features about about x-rays and as you've been learning in the school but also for and for everyone else is that um, so those are useful for identifying atoms is that x-rays although it's just light it interacts with the x-rays in the x-ray regime light interacts with materials in a very in a few different distinct ways and the one is that it can be absorbed by atoms and actually absorption dominates this the process uh, all as as we see the electron uh, orbitals in it in deep electron orbitals have energies that are comparable to x-ray energies and so that's a, a second thing you can use x-rays for is to study the core level electrons and then the third thing is that the wavelength of the light is comparable to the distance between atoms. So you can use X-rays to study the periodic structure of, of, of materials through mostly through X-ray diffraction. But X-ray absorption by itself is actually the first and sort of most obvious thing that happens with X-rays. It's also the dominant process for most of the X-ray regime. And that is just to say that X-rays are in the X-rays are absorbed by matter. In the visible light spectra, X-rays are absorbed and reflected by matter too, and some some substances are transparent, some translucent, and some opaque. In the X-ray regime, it's all atomic level, and so it's much, the dependence is much smoother and less less to do with color than with atomic levels. So, for all absorption processes, you, there's an exponential decay. So there's a characteristic value here, mu, or the absorption coefficient. So if an intensity of light or x-rays i0 hits a sample of thickness t then the the intensity after the sample will be given by i0 times e to the minus mu over t and that mu is the absorption coefficient as units of one over one over length or often uh, described in terms of uh, density too and if we if we look at mu for the x-ray regime it's pretty amazing for the prop for the 
elements um, because of the strong dependence that mu has on both the energy of the x-ray and the atomic number z or also the atomic mass that is it goes to z to the fourth and e to the minus cube so here on the log plot i get the log plot and a log log plot are the absorption coefficients for oxygen iron cadmium and lead you can see that at a particular energy as you go up and see the the increase in absorption is dramatic orders of magnitude and also as you increase the energy by orders of magnitude the decrease in absorption is dramatic so this is why at a synchrotron source the, the walls are made out of lead they're the most absorbing among the most absorbing elements if we could use uranium we we would but that causes other problems so iron or or is a strong absorber as well so you will often have iron uh, or copper <clears throat> absorbing x-rays uh, but light elements like oxygen and carbon do not absorb x-rays uh, much at all or or air and in fact so when you do a, when you get a dental x-ray or you get an x-ray of your hand the flesh in your in your is made up of mostly carbon and oxygen so that doesn't absorb x-rays at all your bones have calcium in them and are denser and the calcium is heavier enough than the cal than oxygen and carbon than that make up the rest of your uh, organic matter that that absorb x-rays a lot and if you're wearing a ring that will or or you have fillings in your teeth that will absorb all of the x-rays so that's how that's why for medical x-rays a high energy x-ray gives good contrast in what the composition of, of a material is. And you can do, you can take that radi that radiograph and spin it and do absorption tomography as well. In fact, maybe some of you are doing that in other, other uh, sessions here or have talked about uh, at other times in this course. In addition, you see these these sharp edges that correspond to the to the core level electron. So when an X-ray has 7.1 keV uh, of energy. It can then be able to excite that deepest one one S level, and so and so cause another absorption to occur. So you see these sharp jumps, and you can do a few things with that. First of all, you can you can go above and below the edge to get differential absorption uh, to distinguish whether that's iron or not. You can also zoom in on that and look at the fine structure of that absorption edge and get interesting properties about the chemical state of the element that is the x-ray has to go into the continuum or into the just unbound just anti-bonding states and so that can be affected by the local coordination the chemistry of that atom so looking at that those edges in detail can will give different spectra that are easily distinguish iron metal from iron two plus from iron three plus and so on so in fact at our beam line most of what we do is a coupling of x-ray fluorescence and x-ray absorption um, Right. Okay. So well, so that's just to say that that's happening. We see that while that's while we're getting that, and the characteristic lines coming from the different elements are well known. So there's here, there's uh, we see in here where the zinc lines are, and we see calcium and iron. Um, if I can get this back back on in log scale mode, on a log scale scale, we see all of this uh, lovely spectral features. So each of these each of these lines has two emissions. So there's K alpha from again from the 2p and K beta again from the 3p levels. And it's known that those relative weights are about an about an order of magnitude. Actually, more like a, a ratio of five or seven to one. So that the first peak here, the for zinc, it's pretty clear to distinct to see them both. That the zinc K alpha here is much stronger than the zinc K beta. And so on for all of these elements. So for manganese, uh, if I can click on manganese, well, there's a K alpha and a K beta. You can just barely see it there, and then it's it's hidden under the iron, which is right on top of it. So with this, we can we can deconvolute these spectra, but because of that strong mu dependence, I'm going to bring this back in because of the strong mu dependence that 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 affects how affected by the thickness of z to the fourth and e to the minus third power that these low energy x-rays two to three kV are attenuated a lot more like 10 times more than these higher energy x-rays so although we see equal intensities for say zinc and potassium that actually means that there's probably 10 times or maybe 100 times more potassium in the sample than there is uh, zinc so doing that quantification can be done but 
but since these effects are orders of magnitude, getting that quantification to a few percent is actually pretty challenging. Also in this in this uh, spectra, I'm going to show, I was, I'm going to just check on the scan, see how the scan's complete. Good. Okay, so in this spectra, we see a few other artifacts that are worth discussing because they, they get to the point of how we collect x-rays, which is always interesting. So we collect x-rays. Again, let's talk, I'm just going to bring this back in. Mu, the, the absorption coefficient. So for, for the ion chamber that we use, it's a gas, helium or nitrogen, won't absorb very many x-rays. But when it does, the x-ray the goes in, excites at 10 keV. It doesn't have a very large cross-section, but it might absor be absorbed by some. And when it does, it'll create an electron and a hole, or electron and ion. And that electron and ion will be, uh, that energy will be turned into a current for the ion chamber. Um, for the fluorescence detector we're using, it's made out of silicon. So the x-rays, the x-rays of different energies penetrate into the uh, silicon. That creates electron and holes in the, in the silicon, and that is measured as a current. And that current is proportional to both the number of x-rays coming in at that energy and the energy of that x-ray. So because we have that energy of the x-ray, each x-ray can be analyzed and we can make this this plot, this histogram of energies that hit the sample. So a 7 keV x-ray hits the silicon, that creates some amount of charge. A 14 keV, a 14 keV x-ray hits the x hits the silicon, and that will create twice as much charge in the and be swept out in the silicon diode. But there's a pro there's a problem for that because we have a lot of x-rays hitting the sample. We have, in fact, if I plot total output counts, we have about two million. Uh, counts entering the detector. And it takes a little bit of time for each of those x-ray energies to be uh, measured for what how much energy was in that current. If you think about if there's a current, you have to like measure the height of that current or the voltage it makes. You might run that through an RC time constant in the in the oldest ways. So they, you need to measure the amount of charge that was collected for each each of these two million x-rays per second. And so that takes, it takes a little bit of time. It takes about a microsecond or a little under a microsecond to be able to, to count that charge. And so there's a, there's a little bit of, of a concern that it's difficult to tell two 7 keV photons from one 14 keV photon or two 5 keV from one 10 keV. So we, there's a, an effect called pileup for that where you can't tell the difference. And in fact, we can model that. So that's, that's why if I go back to our show our iron peak, iron calva is here. And we see all this stuff here. This is 11 kV. That's the x-ray we're sending in. Scattered electrons, rarely scattering, Compton scattering. But there's all this stuff up here. And if I just take, if I just do a simple analysis to predict what the pileup would be, I can do that pretty easily by just convolving the spec, the measured spectra with itself. Uh, that is, take every energy of the spectra and add it to every other energy of the spectra. So convol just convolve the spectra and that will should show a decent approximation of where the pileup should be. And when I do that, that's just this spectra convolved with itself. It does a pretty good job of modeling all of this stuff that's at higher energy above the incident beam. So none of this stuff is real. It's just detector artifact that it couldn't count. It couldn't tell that there that it wasn't a 21 keV X-ray. It probably thought it was actually it's probably really a, two 11 keV X-rays from the Compton and elastic scatter. And there's a peak at twice the the zinc energy and so on. And all of these peaks are from multiple of those. That's okay for the higher energy stuff. But you also see that that in this spectrum that there's, I pan down, that there's these peaks pretty close to where we have, otherwise have manganese uh, here at this peak and iron at the next peak over. There's this other pileup that's from potassium plus pa potassium, potassium plus calcium, calcium plus calcium, potassium plus cal calcium beta. All of these peaks here are the sum of those together. So that's the convolution of that. Uh, so some of this stuff here might be a little complicated due to that pileup. And so sometimes when we're doing fluorescence analysis, we have to pay pretty close attention to this. If we were trying to look for cobalt in the presence of very high potassium and calcium, it might be a little challenging. Um, actually, I think that we could detect copper and nickel okay 
uh, copper is this peak here um, in this spectrum. So that's just to say we can do the, we can do those fluorescence analysis and we can make all the corrections we need to for uh, um, all of the attenuation effects, the strong the strong dependence on attenuation, so that we can, if we need to, we can try to back out uh, reasonably good uh, uh, quantification for uh, for elemental abundance. But for now, we're just going to do this in an imaging mode. So I'm going to read in the rest of the rest of the map data. So we have it's going to count up. I want to read in the rest of it. There's we see all of these different elements, uh, and we're going to read those in, and then we can then we can do the transform. So the transform that we're going to do for the fluorescence tomography is to take the uh, our map of theta and x and translate that into a virtual slice through the sample. So we've rotated our sample through the beam with, with a pencil beam, looking at every possible angle x, uh, sampling every possible angle x. And we've uh, and we can then turn that, it's, it's a simple mathematical transform to turn that into uh, um, an XY map through our sample. If this is building, I'm not sure where it's stuck right now. Uh, again, there's a bit of a lag with all of these. I'm going to close some of these windows, see if that helps. So here's our map again. Actually, here, because of the strong attenuation, there's another effect that you can see with that. Here, the calcium looks like it's really only on the left side of this map. The, the blue curve is much stronger than the on the left than it is on the right side. And that is the detector side. And so when we're over on here on the right-hand side, the calcium x-rays would have to travel through the sample to get to the detector. And so they're attenuated by the sample. So we see much stronger uh, attenuation for calcium than we do for iron or manganese or for zinc. Let's finish this up, see if it's going to add up. Um, good. Um, so we can, so that's an effect and we, that is the reason why we spun the sample all 360 degrees, so that we can sample as much of the exterior of the sample for calcium as possible. Still, when we go into the sample, the calcium x-rays have to make it out, and potassium, have to make it out of the center of the sample. So we might see some effect that we'll see more calcium and potassium on the edge of the sample, and that may not be completely real. We have a possibility that we could uh, do some corrections for that. It's not so simple. But now that we have a full map, replace that one, full 360 degree turn, let's go over to our tomography tools. So here we can take, again, let's start with manganese, um, a single ROI. And if we know, if we can tell which the center pixel is, then we can do that conversion from X theta to X Y. As soon as I can select manganese here, um, and I will say that you saw in the fluorescent spectrum all of our different peaks, and we have these red portions of the spectra. So when, when I say manganese, I actually mean the area under this portion of the curve. Under So I mean those counts are the sum of the portion that portion of the curve. So I've defined this. We could do a better fit to this if we needed to. For this data set, it's fine. None of these elements are so low that that's a problem. So I'm going to say show a new map. Let's look at what that looks like. That's pretty good. So that's then a virtual slice of manganese through our through our seed. So that looks like the exterior of the seed, and there's manganese in very distinct and not at all uniform distribution. Um, if I do that for so I'm going to just try to refine in this process. Uh, I can try to refine the center. I'm going to try to do that automated uh, one more time if I can get to that window. Um, I'm going to allow that to refine and just see how that refines it. It might clean that up a bit. Yeah, that looks a little slightly better to me. We're just trying to make this look as sharp as possible right now. And so that refine, that actually did that refine? Or was it right? Sure. Those are all looking about the same. 
That's a little different, I think. It refined a bit. Uh, maybe to the untrained eye, they look similar. You, you can sort of see these very interesting, you see this very interesting, very sharp spar, spot. Um, I'm going to in, change the contrast level. So here we're saying uh, suppress things that are very hot and suppress things that are very weak and replace that. Uh, that's a little better. It's replaced that. Um, maybe it, maybe that was too much. I'll go in between. And we can also then try um, a different element. So let's try once this is done. Again, this is just the lag. This is not, it doesn't take any time to process this data in this way. Uh, there, that's the our manganese map. But if we look at iron, it looks totally different. It look like this. Completely different. And in fact, if I make a three color plot, again, we saw that in the, and now you can sort of see in the iron map that we made, the iron sinogram that we made, that you could almost see that there's things that go together that we're following together and twisting in and out uh, together for iron. But that wasn't happening for manganese. So if I make a map that's iron and red, manganese and blue, and let's say calcium uh, in in uh, green or in blue, calcium and blue, then that looks about like this. So calcium on the exterior, that is on the exterior. You see, you see uh, green here for for manganese, and then uh, red for for iron. And what this is in the in the interior of the seed, you have you guys do any gardening or know anything about botany, the interior of the seed has a little piece of, of the what's going to be the plant that is the beginning of the leaves, the cotyledons, and it's also got a little piece that's going to be the root or the radical. And this this here, portion here, with the red is the radical. So that's effectively where the veins are in the plant. And the green here is encoding, is showing where the chlorophyll, which uses manganese as for photosystem two to do photosys to do photosynthesis is so when those two uh, em leaves emerge from a from a, a a plant when the plant first germinates and puts those two leaves out they are sorted together like that that's these folded together and then and the all the manganese all the chlorophylls on the exterior of the plant so that it can do photosynthesis immediately uh, and so that's what we're seeing here is those. That, those parts of the plant and then the veins showing in in uh, in red for iron, showing where the iron is. So you can get that well through all of these uh, through all of these methods. There are other elements in this sample, so we could look at we could look at where the zinc is in relationship uh, to that as well. So let's just look at that. Um, and you can see that the zinc is throughout. Uh, you, you see it's sort of cellular like um, you can also see actually so you can see almost like micronish level precision there you can also see though that um, that uh, there is if it, if, when, when it zooms out that there was a little bit of an artifact just off the just off of the seed and that's where the fiber th this over here is where the fiber is which has some zinc scattering happening in it as well um, when we've done this transform, we did it the fastest way we could. There are other methods to do this by using different algorithms for doing the reconstruction. What we used was a, a method called filtered back projection, which is just very fast, as you saw, um, and uses uh, Fourier transforms. So there are these sort of artifacts and sort of noisier uh, portions of the spectra. So there's these lines that emanate from these very sharp peaks. And if we use um, a maximum likelihood method or or similar I will these are iterative techniques so they're much slower but if I sh ask for that to be calculated it'll take a little bit of time to do that I can talk over it while that's happening it'll show it uh, the same attempted at reconstruction but show that um, 
the, as you'll see, the data looks a little bit differently uh, as it goes. So again, but I think we're getting near the end. And I think that we've shown that you can do a pretty interesting set of experiments by using x-rays in, thinking about fluorescence as the, as the modality for measuring your materials, your samples, and look at the elemental abundance and doing fluorescent tomography or other tomographic techniques are pretty cool because you can study the interior of the of the sample without physically sectioning sectioning it. So here's those same that same data set but reconstructed using this maximum likelihood uh, method. And here you can just see that that is a little bit fuzzier, not quite as sharp uh, in all of these features. So for example these little manganese pieces, you don't see evidence for a hole in the center of them that I think we saw with the with the uh, filter back projection approach, but you see uh, pretty good uh, resolution and and uh, much less noisy. So they've suppressed the noise, they've held things together better, and you can tell the distinctions, uh, and you can still see all of the structures. Uh, again, this should be sort of, these pixels should be sort of micron to two micron scale uh, resolution for this image. So that's, a, I think that's a good place to stop. There's lots of things we've covered from how x-rays are measured and how fluorescence works to a little bit of plant science. If you have any questions about this, uh, be sure to let us know. Or uh, if this inspires you to think about other work that you can do with x-ray synchrotrons or x-ray microprobe techniques, uh, that would be uh, wonderful, a wonderful outcome. So I hope you enjoyed this and uh, thanks for paying attention.